Today's lesson is about um, not just stars um, in terms of what they are, but where did they come from and where are they going? Uh, we call this the life cycle of the stars, and you'll see why it's a cycle when we get to the end. So let's um, have a little look at the beginning. So when astronomers first pointed their telescopes up into the sky, they saw the stars and the planets, and they were very excited by their telescopes, but then they would see smudgy patches in the sky. And these smudge patches, they looked like clouds. Um, and it wasn't clear to the astronomers what these things were or where they were. Um, and they were given the name nebula. Now, we now know that some of the things that they looked at are actually entire galaxies that are um, you know, millions of light years away. But some of these nebula, some of these cloud-like objects, genuinely are inside our own galaxy, um, kind of floating around in the space between the stars. We now understand that these clouds are um, largely hydrogen, some helium, sometimes some other materials as well, but pretty much hydrogen and helium. And these clouds are very, very spaced out. Like if you went and stood in the middle of one, you wouldn't really know you were in it perhaps because the particles would be so far apart. But, uh, and they're huge, bigger than the solar system, many times bigger than the solar system. But we can see them through our telescopes as the starlight from stars behind them shine through them and light them up. So what are these clouds of hydrogen? Why are they there? Well, they're kind of left over from when the galaxy formed, and we'll talk about that uh, next week. So these leftover clouds of hydrogen are um, drifting around in the spaces between the stars, but gravity, as we spoke about last lesson, attracts all matter towards all other matter. And even though this is wispy clouds of hydrogen, gravity is doing its thing. And over hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years, gravity pulls pockets of these clouds, these nebula, together. Um, and as the clouds fall together, the gravitational potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy as it rushes towards the center of mass. And as it rushes together, it starts to spiral like water going down a plug hole, and it becomes faster and denser, spinning all the time, ever getting faster and denser and faster and denser, and the particles collide with each other. And so this, these fast-moving particles, we could call them hot particles because their kinetic energy is so high. Hopefully you remember that heat and kinetic energy are, go hand in hand. And as these particles hit together, initially it's just bouncing off each other. But as the gravity continues to collapse it down into a smaller and smaller and smaller volume, and the particles pick up more and more and more speed as they effectively fall together, accelerating all the time, eventually the particles start colliding together with such speed that they manage to overcome the proton-proton electrostatic repulsion, and the protons from the hydrogen begin to fuse. Now that process is pretty complicated. We mentioned it briefly when we were talking about fusion last year when we were doing the radioactivity topic. And what happens eventually is that the hydrogen fuses into helium. And when that happens, a huge amount of heat is released. Now initially, this happens randomly in pockets throughout this spiraling cloud of gas. And so it is releasing heat and light, but not in a predictable, stable way. It's very, very chaotic. However, all the time, gravity is pulling it denser and smaller and closer and hotter and faster. And not only that, but the fusion events that are taking place within this maelstrom of gas is also heating up the inside. And so the thing is really, really getting hotter and hotter and hotter now until eventually <coughs> it forms into what we call a star. A star is an, an immense 
ball of hydrogen and helium. It's about 80% hydrogen, about 20% helium. And the gravity of all that mass is holding it together by pulling all of those particles inwards. But the collapse inwards has been halted by the sheer amount of heat and radiation uh, that is coming out from the center. The, the pressure of the gas in the core of this ball is now immense, and that pressure is pushing outwards. The heat is helping to push it outwards. The radiation streaming from the fusion reactions is pushing outwards. So we've got all of this outward push from the, the, the heat and the radiation, and that is balancing the inward pull of gravity. And when those two things balance and an equilibrium is released, we say that we have got in front of us a stable star. The star will now continue in this form for a very long period of time. In fact, for as long as it has got hydrogen, the star will remain stable. Now, the diagram on the right of your screen here is um, a kind of cartoon version of a very serious graph known as a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's very famous in astronomy. Astronomers have been cataloging tens of thousands of stars in the universe. And some of the stars are brand new, um, have only just been formed. And the astronomers can see them in their kind of juvenile state when they've only just ceased to be protostars. Other stars have um, kind of started to run out of hydrogen, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the vast majority of stars that they see in the sky, the vast, vast, vast majority of them, are all stable stars living out their lives, uh, fusing their hydrogen into helium in this stable equilibrium state. And the fact that when we look up at the sky and we see all of these millions of stars, and nearly all of them are um, in this stable state, tells us that stars must spend the vast majority of their lifetime in this stable state. That's why when we look up, so many of them are these middle-aged stars, because middle age must last for so very long that the beginning bit must be quite short, which is why we don't see many stars in the beginning bit, and the end bit must be quite short, because we don't see that many stars in the end bit. So when you plot a graph, um, actually this graph is about the temperature of the star versus the brightness of the star, which is called the luminosity. And you can see that most of the stars are running across the center of this diagram, across this this sequence in the middle, which is known as the main sequence. Some stars are cool and small. Generally, the star with the biggest surface area, generally, gives out the most light. So these tend to be small stars, and they're cool stars. A kind of red color implies that it's not that hot. I mean, we're still talking thousands of degrees on the surface, millions of degrees in the core. but um, a kind of, you've heard the phrase red hot, white hot. The, um, the hotter the star, the more it moves from the red towards the white hot and the blue at the end. So you can see that when we look at the sky, there are some smallish red stars and some bigish uh, blue stars and everything in between. Um, and this sequence, this main sequence, is where we find most stars to be. And our sun is a bog standard ordinary star nestling in the middle of the red, the main sequence. Kind of a yellowy white color, average size, middle of its life, having a nice time. The um, middle of its life, by the way, it's worth putting that in context. Um, we believe the sun is five billion years old. Just process that number for a minute. Five billion years old. And the reason we believe that is because we've, we've used radioactive dating methods to date the age of the rocks in the Earth. And we know that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. 
and we believe the planets form from the leftover material from the nebula. So when the protostar was forming, maybe 90, 95% of the material that was collapsing down into the protostar becomes absorbed into the final stable star. But the bits right on the edge that didn't quite make it into the star, they will have been left floating around uh, in the region of the star once the star formed and became a localized ball of fusing hydrogen. And all of the bits that didn't make it into the star, we believe then coalesced to become planets. And so if the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, then presumably it formed just a little bit after the sun did. So the sun must be just a little bit older than the Earth is the, is the reasoning. So we believe that the sun is around about 5 billion years old. And from the size of it and the amount of heat and light that it's putting out, we can do some calculations about how much hydrogen we think is in it. Um, and so we think that at the rate at which the sun is currently burning its hydrogen, and the rate uh, and the size of the sun, so roughly how much hydrogen is in it, we suspect that the sun is pretty much halfway through its store of hydrogen. We expect the sun to last for another five billion years, which does give us our first inclination that the sun isn't going to be here forever, and that this um, giver of life that is providing all of the energy for everything that occurs on Earth is not going to be here. Uh, in five billion years' time. I don't think you and I need to worry about that greatly because I don't think you and I are going to be here in five billion years' time either. But that's where we're going in our story. So the sun, middle of the main sequence, not too hot, not too cold, not too big, not too small, not too young, not too old, bog standard star. Okay, middle of the main sequence. But you can see on the diagram there are other areas there are these white dwarfs, uh, which are small, uh, smaller stars with a lower luminosity. Um, still quite hot there. And over here, we've got these stars. Um, very, very large, giving out lots of heat, but quite cool. So these are known as the giants, and these are the dwarfs. So what are they? They're not the main sequence stars. They're not the early stars. They're not uh, the, the middle of the life stars. What are they? Well, let's have a little look. Okay, our journey through the life cycle of a star splits into two at this point. The smaller stars are going to have one future, and the larger stars are going to have a quite different future. So let's think about the smaller stars first, of which our sun counts. So what's going to happen to our sun? Well, in about four billion years, it's going to start running out of hydrogen. The, the end is going to begin in about 4 billion years. And what's that going to mean for the star? Well, the fusion is happening in the core of the star, where the pressure is greatest, where the heat is greatest, where the particles of hydrogen, the protons basically, have enough kinetic energy that when they slam together, they can get close enough to each other to fuse. Remember, they're both positive and they're repelling each other. So they've got to come together very fast in order to overcome the repulsion. Mm -hmm. In the outer layers of the star, the fusion isn't happening. It's just a hot gas because there isn't the pressure and there isn't the temperature to cause fusion to happen. The fusion is happening in the core. So even the entire star is made of hydrogen, it's only the hydrogen in the core that's managing to fuse. And the pressure is outwards, so the hydrogen on the outside of the star can't get to the core. So when I say that the star starts running out of hydrogen, I mean the core starts to run out of hydrogen. And what you find is that fewer and fewer and fewer, fewer fusion events occur. There just aren't that many hydrogens floating around in the core anymore. And so um, statistically, it just becomes less and less and less likely that two protons will bump into each other because there are just fewer and fewer and fewer protons there. The core is starting to fill up with helium and it's getting in the way of the protons as well. So at some point in about four billion years time, the fusion is going to stop. 
it'll gradually decrease and then it'll just drop off the cliff because as soon as we don't have the fusion, the core starts to go cold. And that's a runaway effect then. Cold means less heat. Less heat means less outward pressure. Less outward pressure means that gravity wins and the star begins, it, begins its collapse again. Our sun will have been fighting gravity for nine billion years, but eventually gravity will win and the star will start to collapse. But then we're in protostar territory all over again. More gravitational potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy and again the inside of the star starts to heat up. But this time it's the layer of hydrogen around the helium core that now starts to fuse. So what happens is that the core kind of becomes a shell around the original core. And we've got a new core to the star. It's just not in the middle. It's surrounding the middle as a shell of fusing hydrogen around the helium core. This means that the shell around the core starts to get hot. <coughs> this means that the heat is a little bit further out than it was before. And, and a, a, a layer of the star kind of just outside the core now starts to expand and it pushes the whole star outwards. And this makes the star swell up. But then eventually that hydrogen will will give up and so then the star starts to collapse again but then it's the next layer of hydrogen that starts to heat up and fuse and that pushes the star out even more so the net effect is that even though there are minute little contractions every now and again the general effect is that the heat from the fusion is moving outwards through the star which is expanding layer by layer by layer further out from the star so that the entire star is swelling up but there's still the same amount of heat coming out of it as there ever was. But now that heat is spread out, heat and light is spread out over a much larger surface area of the much larger sphere, which means that each patch of the surface is releasing less light than it was before. So each patch of the surface starts to look a little bit cooler, so a little bit redder and a little bit dimmer, which means that the star is starting to get very, very big but very, very red. We call this phase of the star's lifetime a red giant. It's a very, very, very big fusing star, but the heat coming out of any particular meter squared of its surface is less than it used to be because it's bigger than it used to be. These are the red giants, cool, big, fusing stars. Our sun will swell up so big that it will devour Mercury and Venus and its surface will stop around about the orbit of the Earth, which means even if it doesn't swallow the Earth, it will um, reduce it to molten rock. So when the sun dies, I'm afraid the Earth will go with it, which means this cradle of humanity will not be around forever. And we better work out how to get off it in the next five billion years. The sun will spend maybe a million years, a little bit longer perhaps, in the red giant phase. But eventually, the star will swell so big that the outer layers of it cease to be held there by the gravity anymore. The Gravity reduces with distance, if you remember. And eventually, these outer layers of hydrogen will just drift away into space. And when they do drift away into space, the star will suddenly be reduced to merely the original core, that white hot ball of helium that's still there in the center of the star from all those years ago. <clears throat> and it's just revealed to the universe as this small, white hot, dense ball of gas. 
it's no longer fusing, but it has still got nine billion years worth of uh, heat left inside it from all those billions of years of fusion that went on. Stars don't dump their heat and light very easily. Um, what comes out is a fraction of what's in them. We call these small, white hot stars white dwarfs. It is the future of our sun. It's still mostly the mass of the sun. Most of the mass was in the core. Um, but it's now only about the size of the Earth. No longer fusing, so there's no source of new heat, which means over the millions of years that will follow, this small ball of um, searingly hot gas will gradually cool down. And as it cools down, it will fade, and its light will turn off, and the future of our sun is that it will just quietly vanish into the blackness of space. The atoms will still be there, and if you were to happen to be flying around in a spaceship and you bumped into it, you'd know about it. Um, but we, it won't show up anymore. When we look at the sky, we won't be able to see it. It's just going to be dark. You can't see a non-luminous object unless there's a light source next to it shining light on it. And there will be no light source. We won't be able to see it. So it will still be very small, but no longer white. We will refer to it as a black dwarf. This is the future of the sun and all medium to small stars. And so after such an exciting life, giving uh, energy to the only life in the universe, our sun is gonna have a very quiet old age and a very quiet retirement, but not so the largest stars. So let's go back to what happens after the main sequence stage comes to an end and ask, what if you're a larger star? And we're talking around about 10 times the sun and bigger. And stars get huge. So there's a little picture on your screen just to indicate um, the, the difference in sizes of some of the stars that we've observed in the universe. But I've got a little short YouTube clip for you. So let me just switch what I'm sharing. Um, if it doesn't um, play very well over you know, a Google Meet, you can always play it yourself uh, later on. It's only a quick clip. So let's have a little look. Should I turn the music off? It's a bit clear. Ooh, hang on. There we go, it's a bit smoother without the music on. So these are the planets in the solar system going by. And you can see the relative size, but look how big our sun is compared to the planets. Earth is just a pixel in this picture. But look what happens to the sun. These are all other stars. Um, look how small the sun is compared to some of these other stars. The sun is now as small compared to these stars as the Earth is compared to the sun. And what? only about halfway through the simulation. Beetlejuice is um, visible with the naked eye. It is so bright. If you find um, that constellation last lesson that I was telling you about, Orion with the three belts, um, one of his arms is uh, Beetlejuice. So, some stars are just immense, and it, it can't be emphasized enough um, just how average size the sun is and how much bigger some other stars are. Okay, back to the presentation. Okay, so what's going to happen to these huge stars? Well, 
these stars have so much gravity that the core of the star is under unbelievable uh, pressure, which is forcing the protons together in greater numbers than in our sun, which means that the fusion is happening at such a faster rate. You've studied in chemistry processes that affect rates of reaction, and I'm sure you've spoken about the pressure of the gases increasing the rate of reaction. Well, it increases the rate of fusion as well, which makes the inside of the star even hotter because there's so much fusion going on. And because there are so many particles, the heat can't get out either. So we're producing heat at a faster rate, and that heat is um, producing heat at a faster rate. And the heat can't escape because there are so many particles. What this means is that the fusion in the center of a giant star happens at a much faster rate than in a small star. And whereas the sun might live for 10 billion years, large stars might only live for 10 million years. Such is the rate of the fusion that they gobble up their hydrogen so very quickly. And you might think, well, that just means that they get to the end game quicker, and they do. But it's more interesting along the way because all that extra heat allows the helium to fuse as well. It's not just the hydrogen that gets to play the fusion game. And what happens is that the core of the star will run out of helium, uh, hydrogen, but it'll just carry on fusing the helium instead. And then lithium and boron and beryllium and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, it'll just carry on. Such is the heat in the center of a massive star. And outside of the core, all those layers of hydrogen, they're going to get in on it too. It's so much hotter there that as soon as the core starts to cool a little bit and the star does that little collapsy thing for a moment, it heats up the outer layer and the hydrogen in the core will do exactly what it does in the sun, but it won't just stop at hydrogen. So we're going to get a layer playing catch up with the core. The core will always be a, a few elements ahead on the periodic table than the layer around it and the layer around that and the layer around that. So this star will swell up, but it will seriously swell up. It was a huge star in the first place. When it swells up now, it becomes what we would call, what we call not just a red giant, but a super giant. It was already red giant state size before it even began to swell up. And when you look inside a, a super giant, it's not just hydrogen and helium you see. It's all the layers of the periodic table, starting with the heavier elements in the middle, coming out to hydrogen and helium on the outside. It's like a little periodic table factory. Then something interesting happens when we get to iron, something catastrophic. We mentioned very briefly when we were talking about fusion in the nuclear physics topic that energy is only released when you fuse the smaller elements. By the time you get to iron, which is in the middle of the periodic table, iron is the break-even point. Making an atom of iron doesn't release any energy. And as soon as you pass iron in the periodic table, it takes energy to make the fusion happen. What was an exothermic process suddenly becomes an endothermic process. And the core is this runaway machine that can't be stopped. It's building nucleus after nucleus after nucleus after nucleus, and it runs straight past iron and starts fusing products that are endothermic. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, the core goes cold. I don't mean just goes cool like a white dwarf for our sun. I mean energy is sucked out of the sun. And very, very, very quickly, the center of the star goes cold and gravity massively wins. And what we've been seeing before is that it's being a kind of gentle relaxa relaxation of equilibrium in which the core shrinks a bit and then reheats itself and grows a bit. That's not going to happen this time. The core is now dead and it's not going to be restarted. What happens next is known as a supernova, 
which I'm sure you've heard of. The center of the star just gives up and gravity wins and the entire star, which is now bigger than the entire solar system, collapses inwards. What happens next is complicated, but effectively in under a second, the star collapses in on its core and the inrushing material kind of bounces off the solid iron core. The amount of gravitational potential energy that is released creates effectively a solar system sized hydrogen bomb and the star explodes. And in that moment, it releases more heat and light than it did over its entire lifetime. We've caught supernova on camera through telescopes. And when the supernova occurs, that one star outshines its entire galaxy. We have seen supernova take place in Andromeda. And for a moment, that one patch of Andromeda outshines the other 100 billion stars that are in the Andromeda galaxy. Supernova are cataclysmic events, a star ripping itself apart and exploding itself into the galaxy. What's left behind is a remnant of the core. It will have a mass more than our sun does now, but it will be compressed into a volume smaller than a city. The gravity of that much mass that close together is unimaginably big. So big that the gravitational attraction manages to pull the electrons inside the protons and causes them to cease to exist and to turn themselves into neutrons. And so the remnant of the core that's left behind is a, a city-sized nucleus. It has no protons and no electrons. It's just a ball of neutrons, solid nuclear material. The density of such is if you had a bucket of it, it would weigh the same as Mount Everest. It's called a neutron star is the densest known object in the universe. Just like an ice skater pulling her arms together as she spins into a pirouette, the neutron star is spinning like crazy. As all that mass collapsed down in on itself, it started to spin faster and faster and faster. Neutron stars can spin 10 to 100,000 times in a single second. Imagine spinning Manchester 100,000 times a second. It's just ridiculous. Um, any infalling matter that is left in orbit around the neutron star rains down on the neutron star. And as it does so, and it collides with the neutron star, it produces a beam of radio waves. And these radio waves are focused in a beam. And that beam generally doesn't coincide with the rotation axis of the neutron stars, which means that the neutron star acts like a lighthouse beaming across the galaxy, a narrow beam of radio waves um, with a rotational period of a hundred thousandth of a second. We picked these radio signals up in telescopes on Earth. In the 1950s, it was believed that it was the first evidence of UFOs because the uh, frequency of the blips on the radio wave that were being picked up by the telescopes was more regular than our best atomic clocks on Earth. And they were christened pulsars and later they were discovered to, to be these neutron stars spinning so fast. Um, but, but these pulsars, the, these blips of radio waves, um, they are the most accurate clocks in the universe. Um, we compare our own atomic clocks to them to check that everything's going fine. And they're so distinctive with their perfectly distinct frequency that doesn't change because there's no frictions in space to slow the neutron star down. 
um, we can use these things as um, marker points in space. We can use them for galactic um, navigation by comparing where we are to known pulsars. <clears throat> but for the truly massive stars, the truly enormous ones, the gravity is so strong that the neutrons are pulled together. And we don't know what happens next. What we do know is that we know of no known force that can resist the attraction of the gravity after that. So if the neutrons collapse, we know of no process that can stop the collapse. And so the theories predict that the remaining mass of the star will collapse down to a point of zero size, known as a singularity. Now, we, we suspect that this is our ignorance, that we don't know enough physics. We don't know what happens next. What we do know, though, is that there will be a zone around whatever is there at the singularity point, a zone known as the event horizon, within which nothing can ever escape, not even light. So whatever is close to where the core of the star used to be, we believe we will never, ever know because no light from it can ever re-enter the universe to tell us what it is. And if we sent a probe in there to take a look, its signals would not be able to escape the gravity to come back to us. And the probe wouldn't be able to escape the gravity to come back to us. So we've christened, christened these things black holes. And science fiction has run away with the word hole, as in like it's a gateway to somewhere or, or something like that. But the reality of it is, it's a name that means crushing gravity that destroys everything. So if you've ever watched any films about black holes, they're probably not correct. Um, if you try to send your spaceship into a black hole, you're going to get crushed to oblivion. And nobody will ever know what happened to you because nothing can ever leave that region of space anymore. These have been hypothetical objects until last year. And last year, the photograph on your screen was taken. Um, I've put a link to how it was taken because the story is very interesting if you're into that kind of thing. It took uh, a huge team of scientists, a huge number of telescopes, a huge number of years to do the measurement. Uh, what you're looking at is uh, an accretion disk. It's infalling matter, which is heating itself up as it falls towards the black hole. And then in the center of it is blackness. And we can't see what happens to the red glowing gas. It just disappears. We're assuming that the blackness is the event horizon of the black hole and that the gas is disappearing from the universe. And we don't know what happens to it after that. We don't know. Um, the nearest black hole to us is tens of thousands of light years away. We're not going to find out anything new anytime soon. But maybe when the James Webb Telescope comes on board, we can retake this photograph and take a better look at it. That's the end of the star, but it's not the end of the story. See, when the star exploded, it threw itself out into space. Only a small amount of it, maybe 10%, was left behind as the neutron star or the black hole. The other 90% has been ejected out into space at nearly the speed of light. And that ever expanding cloud of atoms is now going to fly out into the galaxy. And at the speed of light, it's only going to take a few hundred thousand years before it collides with something. What's it going to collide with? It's going to collide with one of those nebulas that we started the story with. What I didn't explain at the beginning is why it starts to collapse in on itself. In all likelihood, it's the arrival of a cloud of ejected supernova material that triggers the 
uh, original infalling, uh, the in original collapse of the nebula. But second time round, it will no longer be a nebula of just hydrogen and a little bit of helium. It's now got the entire periodic table. The star produced up to iron while it was fusing. But during the supernova, during that second of explosion, there was enough energy to produce the entire rest of the periodic table, all the way up to uranium and beyond. When this ejected material collides with a nebula and triggers as the formation of a new star, it's what we call a second generation star, because it's not just hydrogen and helium. It's all the other elements too. Now for a second generation star, it's probably still mostly hydrogen and helium. But this is going to happen again and again. And by the time a second generation star supernovas, there'll be even more of the heavier elements because the second generation star already contained a load of heavier elements before it supernova. By the time a third generation star supernova uh, forms from a second generation supernova, the entirety of the periodic table is there. So when I said the planets formed from the leftover material, the leftover material from a first generation star is just hydrogen and a bit of helium. Best you're going to get is gas giants. When a third generation star forms, what's left over? is the entirety of the periodic table. And that leftover material that didn't make it into the star is going to form the planets, rocks, oceans, trees, you. And what you need to understand is that every single atom in your body has been through the heart of probably two supernovas that you are made literally of stardust and your atoms are at least five billion years old, probably older than that. And the hydrogen, the hydrogen was here originally. That's got nothing to do with the stars. So every hydrogen atom in your body, that's as old as the universe itself. So you might think of yourself as 16 years old, but in actual fact, you are billions of years old, which is quite cool, I think. Okay. I would like you to go away and think a lot about what you've learned today, because it's the kind of information that every human on the planet should just carry around in their head with them for the rest of their days. To be able to look up at the stars and think, that's where I came from. However, to help you to consolidate and to think about it, um, you might like to watch this video when I finish talking in a minute. Um, he's a professional astronomer um, and he's got at his disposal a whole load of um, cool graphics uh, which bring everything I've just said to life. So you might wanna watch that, it's only about three minutes long. And then you might wanna try to uh, learn the, the key points of what I've just said. So uh, this cycle um, that I'm talking about that has these key moments in it, try to learn the names, try to learn the sequence that it happens in. Um, try to play it back in your head. When you have dinner with your family later, if you do that kind of thing, then start a conversation and try to tell your family a nugget of what I just said using some of these words on the screen in front of you. Today's been about the origin of the stars, and I hope you found it interesting, and I hope you do find it thought-provoking and you do think about it. But it doesn't quite measure up even what I've said today to what we're going to do next week, which is not the origin of the stars, but the origin of the universe itself which is an even more exciting story.